Welcome to Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin. It's ideas that matter to women of worth. And joining me in the studio, Margaret Thomas, the daughter of Francis Thomas, whose memoirs, uh, Memoirs of a Migrant, have recently been reissued. He was a migrant who made a difference. He came to Singapore. He was an English man who was welcomed by the local community and assimilated to the extent that he made a huge difference, not only in terms of the uh, social sector, but he was a great contributor in the educational sector he was a principal he was a teacher he was principal of St. Andrew's Secondary from 1963 to 1974 he was a man of many contradictions he went to Cambridge and yet talks about learning disabilities early on in his life but then went on to become, uh, you know, a much distinguished educator. Um, and I think one of the reasons why this particular book, Memoirs of a Migrant, is so enjoyable is that you get this full picture of Francis Thomas as a man, uh, warts and all, that comes through. So, Margaret Thomas, thank you so much for joining us to tell us more about the book and your father. I'm happy to be here. Why did you want to have this book reissued? Um, because it was published in 1972. It was based on a series of articles that appeared in the New Nation, um, which was a broadsheet in that time. And when it was published um, in 1972, it was uh, the publisher, I think, went bus soon after that or disappeared. And so the book was out of print very quickly. And um, I think it's important that Singapore... that that we document, that there's more documentation of, of our history, of uh, that um, the stories that, that we hear more stories of people, um, that uh, there are many different uh, accounts of history, there are many different perspectives and truths, and the more that we document, the richer is our appreciation of the past. So at various points, um, he died in 1977, just five years after the book was first published. And over the years, I tried a few times to interest people in reissuing it, um, but nobody saw any commercial potential in, in it. And I was at the point of publishing it myself, you know, just paying to get it published, just to get it back into circulation, when um, I met Ho Fang of Ethos Books, and he was ready to take it on, and, and so we reissued it. Uh, with a slight difference, it's, it's the, the original memoirs of a migrant intact, but we added to it some of his other writings, uh, which we found interesting, plus uh, a few pieces um, in which people, after he died, people pay tribute to him because his good friend then, uh, Devanaya, uh, wanted after his death to, to bring out a book called Memorial to a Migrant. He wrote to various people to get their contributions, mm. and quite a few did. Um, but he ran out of steam. He didn't have time to complete it. Um, I was too young uh, and didn't have time to, to do anything about it. So when this was reassured, I was very glad to be able to complete what Devon tried to do. He was found a member of the Labour Party of Singapore back in 1948. Mm -hmm. So he's part of this party um, at a time where Singapore was trying to shrug off colonial rule. And yet he mm. came to Singapore as part of this mm. uh, you know, elite class. Yeah, but he recognised that he was part of the colonial power, but he never saw himself as a colonialist. I mean, when he came out to Singapore, it was because after graduating from Cambridge, he didn't know what to do. Um, he, said he heard about the job in Singapore in uh, mission school. He went for the interview and he found out that there were perhaps three applicants. One didn't come, the other one was deaf or something like that, and he got the job. And initially he couldn't even find Singapore on the map. But when he did, it was home almost immediately to him? Yep. Yeah, he sailed out and, and he says that when he got to, as he got towards the east, the smells of India, and then he got to Penang, this is 1930s, and the smell of the jungle, you know, he fell in love with it. And, and then he got to Singapore and he just knew that this is where he wanted to be. There was a vibrancy about this part of the world coming as he did from uh, Britain that was, uh, when he was born, the Second World War was about to happen. And uh, between the two world wars, uh, you, uh, England, Europe was in a financial um, economic slump and there was unemployment. There was a sense of hopelessness. Mm. And he was glad to come, come to a place that was young and had its future ahead of him. Um, he's focused on making a difference though. It, it comes mm. through on many different levels. Why did he join the Labour Party? So it was, Why he, did he, he said it? it was a totally random um, uh, act. He happened to no see a notice in the papers that a meeting was being held by people who were keen to form a Labour Party and because he had nothing else to do, he went down. 
And he half expected to be thrown out because there he was an Englishman and this was a local party that presumably would want independence. And to his surprise, he was warmly embraced and very much involved in the uh, setting up of the party. What, what do you think Francis Thomas would think of Singapore today, Margaret? Uh, I think he would have been very encouraged to see the the um, increasing presence in the last what five ten years, increasing presence and confidence of the um, of civil society. Um, he wouldn't have been so impressed, I think, um, with the idea of million dollar ministers. Um, he would, I, I think, he would have accepted the need to pay people, competent people, a decent wage for running a country. Um, all those arguments about making, paying people so that they don't turn to corruption and so on. But I think he would have been appalled at the idea that ministers' salaries are pegged to the top 10 or 10% 10 of earners in the professions. Um, this is not to him what uh, leadership, what political leadership is all about. Because he viewed it as uh, very much... It's a responsibility. If you have the capability, if you have the... Uh, passion, the desire to, to do something for your country, for your people. I think he calls it an intolerable burden of service. Right? Yeah, he very much respected Lee Kuan Yew um, because uh, this was a man of, of great ability who was ready to take on this, this burden of leadership mm. and of making hard decisions in, in difficult times. Um, but, but the times in the 50s and 60s, there was a need for a strong leader. You know, and he, was, he very much respected Lee Kuan Yew and approved to a large extent of what the um, uh, PAP was doing, having had a part um, in, in, uh, in, I wouldn't say in the rise of the PAP, but when he was a member of the Labour Fund government and um, crossed the floor in Parliament to sit on the opposition, that means with uh, PAP, when Lee Kuan Yew was challenging, calling for a commission of inquiry into um, alleged corruption in the government. What were his views on um, the role of the individual in society? And mm. you have a passage there, perhaps. Yeah, that when I was looking through, yeah, looking through some things, I found that in 1973, and it was interestingly enough a speech he made at the girls' school, the Kochuan Girls' School, the speech day. Um, he, he talked about you are still in a man's world. It was only 150 years ago that girls were sold as slaves on what is now the Padang, and he made the point that. Um, you have to speak up. Uh, you uh, women, girls, need to make their voices heard. And then he went on to say, and I, let me quote, there is a silly idea that a loyal citizen will never stand up to disagree with his government. The truth is just the opposite. We should say yes to what is right and no to what is wrong. The reason power gets into the hands of a few is that too many people run away from saying no. They do not like the intellectual effort of judgment and understanding, and they don't like the risk of making anyone angry. Now, he said this in 1973. Today, in 2014, I think it is as relevant. Um, with, with the rise of civil society, I, I, perhaps I shouldn't say rise, with the increasing presence of civil society, we are getting people who are um, saying no and, and giving good reasons for saying no. It's not just a uh, emotional protest against certain things. There are people who are working to uh, support their points of view with research, um, with very considered research. And we can't speak about your father without understanding a little bit about you, Margaret. Um, you were a speaker at the Women's Choices, Women Lives Forum back in mm -hmm. 1984, and that led to the formation of AWARE. And, yeah. you know, even as you read that that um, particular passage from your father talking, encouraging girls to speak up, you're mm. sitting there in the shut up and sit down t-shirt <laughs> that is a collector's item yes. uh, that reminds us of the heckle that came at the AWARE mm -hmm. uh, EOGM that I think not many people know was directed at you. Yeah. Um, we we I, we were referred to as the old guard then the old timers that were. Um, we we had a plan at the EGM of the points that we were going to make, and my job at various points was to stand up and say um, point of order, which is what you're supposed to do at these meetings, and then make a statement. And in this case, the then president of Aware, Josie Lau, was um, going on about the achievements of Aware. 
Um, this riled a lot of us because she they had no part in any of this, and yet they were claiming all the things that we had done over the last 20, 25 years. And so there was a house rule of three minutes per speaker, and we decided, well, this should apply to the president too. And so I stood up to say point of order and something like, I'm sorry, Josie, but your three minutes are up. And of course, she um, protested and so on. And then um, a member of her team, um, Sally Ung, suddenly barked, shut up and sit down. And this just triggered something. The the, the audience, and there were two, three thousand of us, okay, not everyone was on our side, but they all just stood up. And this was such an offensive uh, um, tactic because this was exactly what we didn't want. And this, I think, was um, led to a lot of people um, realizing that they needed to get involved in this EGM, you know, and speak up. Yeah. Leading to that T-shirt becoming a collector's item. Yep, that's why I wore it it's today. It's really, really nice. I wish I had one. <laughs> uh, do you think your father's legacy has shaped your work? I suppose so. But, you know, it's not like a conscious thing in which you grow up saying, I got to be like this. That's not the way he operated as a father. I mean, he just um, um, did his thing. I don't remember him dispensing wisdom or points of instruction. You know, anything that I... Uh, learn from him was glean or a genetic imprint or something or it's just from his being I mean by example and not something you you sit at his um, knee and learn if you know what I mean um, but I, I suppose it's there I mean the, the, the belief this thing about speaking up and um, um, also the uh, wariness about bureaucracy and um, the the sort of majority, the tyranny of the majority. Um, these are things that you grow up with and I suppose you carry on with your life. More from Margaret Thomas. We're talking about memoirs of a migrant uh, by Francis Thomas, recently reissued. Who was Francis Thomas, the man, the migrant? What was he like in his role as husband, educator? And did his political ideas shift? More in the Wow Club. Stay with me. Add to your Wow Factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live. is my guest in WOW. This is Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin and we're talking about Memoirs of a Migrant, an autobiography by Francis Thomas, recently reissued. Francis Thomas is Margaret Thomas's father, her late father. He was found a member of the Labour Party, Minister for Communications and works in two Labour Front governments from 1955 to 59. I'm sure those of you who pass by Francis Thomas Drive on a daily basis uh, over at St. Andrews are familiar with the name since he was Principal of St. Andrews Secondary from 1963 to 1974. We're finding out more about the migrant who made such change happen here in Singapore in so ma- on so many levels. Um, and I shaped the show by asking Margaret right at the start, what would Francis Thomas think of Singapore today? And uh, there, there's a great excerpt that uh, I think you have to share with us about, about the depersonalization. Yeah, this, uh, Let me quote this couple of lines from his book. Mm-hmm. Um, he says... We are moving into a depersonalized society where the individual loses value and is treated as a unit of cost. Now, he wrote this in early 1970s. He goes on, "Our Our revolution must be to recognize the personal value of each individual, his right to be different and to follow his own way of life. That will not be easy in the new Singapore, but it is vital for the future. I think the sad thing about Singapore, what he would uh, lament if he were here today, is that we this is still an issue. Forty years later, um, we are still caught up in this, you know, of, of being viewed as a unit of cost. Um, the personal value of each individual, the right to be different, to follow his own way of life, um, this is not necessarily accepted by everybody in Singapore. And including the policy makers. It gives us great insight into um, how much he respected the individuality mm-hmm. of each person. And um, 
he talks about his experience as a POW during the war. Mm. Um, and even then, you, you get a sense that he can see through the roles played by his captors mm. uh, and, and, and value or, or somehow empathize with what it is they had to carry out in their role as uh, captors. Mm. Yeah, I think he, the thing about him that comes through in his book is he's, he can talk about being there, a player in what was going on, but he can also step back and see it in a broader context. Um, he, he didn't see many accounts of the uh, wars of the Second World War filled with uh, the Japanese atrocities and all the rest of it. He talks about those unhappy incidents in a very matter-of-fact way, and then he actually makes a comment in his book um, he didn't think the Japanese, and you know, he was on the death railway in, in Siam, and there was a lot of hardship, a lot of deaths. And he didn't think the Japanese that who were running the camps were intentionally cruel. They just had a job to do, and it's just to build a railway. And their need to build the railway was the, was greater than the lives of the prisoners. And you know, so this ability to step back and see things and not to blame it. I mean, he saw, he, he recognized that the Japanese captors, the people he had to deal with, uh, like the prisoners of war, were players in a game played by political leaders, military leaders in uh, far away and um, not to be blamed directly. After the war, he comes back mm. to Singapore mm. and um, takes, uh, you know, continues in his role as educator. Yeah. And in fact, in his life, his, his life revolved around being an educator, even meeting his wife, mm. right, your mother. Yes. They met because they were both working together. Yeah, he returned in 1947, returned to Singapore and uh, was made housemaster at the boarding school, St. Andrew's boarding school. And there was a great demand for places in the boarding school then post-war because um, some of the boys were orphans, they came from the region. Yeah. And my mother um, joined the, the staff at the boarding house. She, she'd been a nurse before, mm. and they were looking for somebody. Um, she, she had a child because she had an earlier marriage, and she was a widow. And uh, she welcomed the job because it came with board and lodging. Yeah. So she was matron, and he as housemaster and matron, they had to work closely together. He would have to drive her around <laughs> in his beat up old car looking for the best butcher or the best baker and so on or perhaps the cheapest baker and <laughs> so, so um, he got to see the way she worked with the kids uh, little boys and she she, he, he, she she brought to the job he says uh, much greater care and devotion than was required and little did she know that he was falling in love with her is it true she was surprised when he proposed yeah, exactly um, after a year a uh, year or more of working together one day and, and accounts of it vary and my mother would tell us that this happened in the kitchen other times it would be this happened in the, some meeting so I'm not too sure just when it happened but he proposed to her and um, and she, her, her response was kind of um, who me uh, but I'm so unattractive or words to that effect because he really was attractive I've seen well, photos of him yeah I mean yeah. and she was she, he was like nearly six feet and dashing quite dashing mm. Englishman mm -hmm. he used to roll so he had you know he was he was built yeah mm -hmm. my mother was like five foot nothing barely five <laughs> foot and very homely you know um, but his response to her remark was uh, along the lines of it's not what I see outside that makes me want to marry you it's what I see inside yeah um, she was very sceptical. She made him wait because she knew that he had, well, friends, yeah. English girlfriends. Well, not girlfriends, but women friends. Or uh, There were English women who were after him. She made him wait for a year. And during that time, I don't know whether she asked for it on his, his own accord, he did it. He would write to some of these women and show her the letter to say, please stop corresponding with me because I'm engaged to be married. Well... Yeah, so you did put in the effort then. Yeah, yeah well. <laughs> <laughs> More from Margaret Thomas. We're talking about her late father, Francis Thomas, and the reissuing of his memoirs. We'll continue with the Wow Club in just a while. Add to your Wow Factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live.
Welcome to Women of Worth or Wow. I'm Michelle Martin and joining me, such a privilege to speak with Margaret Thomas. We're talking about Memoirs of a Migrant, the reissued autobiography that her father Francis Thomas put together. Uh, Margaret is a former journalist. It is always great fun to chat with a former journalist because she knows what I'm going to ask before I ask it. <laughs> it's a lot of like being with a Jedi mind reader. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Margaret. We, we want to find out more about uh, your dad's personal values, uh, Francis Thomas. Uh, for a start, a broad question. Do you think enough people here in Singapore understand um, his role here uh, or are, are aware of his role? I think the majority of people have no idea, no, no, no knowledge about him at all, or no knowledge about some of the early political leaders. I mean, history, for a long time, they didn't teach history in schools. I mean, I, I had history in my time. That was a long time ago. Um, I saw recently some report that the hi history books or for, for a certain type of class, I think, is now going to include the early history of Singapore. That means going back to the 14th century or something. That's a good good thing. Mm -hmm. and he is part of our history. There is Francis Thomas Drive. There's With, actually a road named after mm -hmm. your father. Within St. Andrew's School, yeah. Yeah, uh. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's why I said earlier, I wanted to reissue the book to get it out in circulation again because I think all these accounts from our past are very important to keep alive. Uh, not many, I, okay, as a book, not many people read these days, but if the book is there, it's available, and somewhere someone might pick it up and read a little bit and go on reading and glean a few things that makes them feel um, um, uh, good, you know, that, that uh, teaches them something, that it resonates with them in some way. You spoke about um, refining on page 32 or something, a line that immediately connected with you. Absolutely. I fell in love with Francis Thomas because of page 32 when he writes, I am addicted to reading in much the same way I'm addicted to smoking. I read unless something is going on that prevents me. And then he goes on to talk about how he had a reading anxiety because when <laughs> uh, the addiction was neither academic nor career oriented, the fact that a book is prescribed reading or required for any practical purpose makes it automatically almost unreadable to me. Yeah. I, I I don't know whether he passed it on to me, but I suffer from that same problem. <laughs> and you know, when he talks about the strange sleepiness that overtook him in Matt's yep, class, yep. Uh, that was you know you can identify, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. He comes across as so real, now, so relatable. This, this is a guy. If he were alive today, be 102 years old. When he went to school, that was, I mean, way before even your parents were born. I think. Yes. You know, and yet what he says is so true for people today. <laughs> <laughs> he, sp he speaks with such uh, honesty and he writes, mm. um, he writes with a simplicity and a clarity. I think that yeah, makes and his it's book a very so accessible. accessible way. Yeah. Exactly, which is why I think I, I, I hope more people will read it. Not, I, no one's really making any money from this kind of book. Mm. But I think um, there, there's something, you, there's value in the book. Mm. You know, there are lessons about life which are relevant today. And there are lessons which I wish some of our policy makers, um, I wish they would read it and glean a few things about running a place. Can you share with us uh, an, an excerpt where he, I, I think in this particular excerpt, you get a sense of how hard he perhaps pushed himself. Hmm. Um, in, in which? I think the fourth excerpt where he talks about the responsibility of an individual to make the most of yourself. Ah, yeah. Okay, there, there's, this is actually um, not something in, from the book, but something he wrote in 1977 when he was ill with cancer. And um, let me just read it. He was talking about the lack of an informed opposition in Singapore or the lack of people in Singapore in 1977 who had real knowledge and interest about what was going on around them in, in Singapore and in the world. Um, he says, at present, too many of us are like the giraffes or hippopotami in our zoo or the birds in the bird park. Our needs are foreseen and provided for. We can be the admiration of visitors from less happy lands, but we lack the ability and scope to plan for ourselves. We have not been robbed of that scope. We have failed to develop it through our own weakness of mind and spirit. And this was his feeling that that you need to you need to take an interest in what's going on around you you can't just leave it to other people to to decide um, uh, to decide basically their country's future mm. that you don't necessarily have to be a political leader yourself 
but you need to have an interest so that you can speak up and you can make your views known and you can um, make wise decisions. And that this would not threaten, uh, but actually would strengthen, would, would strengthen society and was necessary for its future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he goes on to say, I mean, he acknowledged in, in this piece, it's a, it's a two-page note which um, summed up some of his thinking at that time. And he goes on to say, uh, this is 1977, we have a government which must be amongst the best governments in the world by any reasonable standard. Uh, we have no opposition and we hope to have a future. In 1977, there was no opposition. Uh, he says we need to start now to prepare for that future. We need to build among our citizens a reasonable understanding and interest for the abstract concepts which will be needed for national unity. We need to put flesh and blood onto them by being much better informed about affairs both within Singapore and in the world around. Mm. And, you know, it's really an, an argument for for civil society, for citizens to take an interest in what's going on around them, to equip themselves with the knowledge and understanding so that they can participate in the running of the place. Take personal responsibility for that. I asked about whether your father pushed mm. himself uh, because I, you know, what, what really stayed with me after reading this book was a particular entry where he outlines his day minute by minute. Mm, the, the, I think it, that was to prove to show how as a school as a principal mm. so much time was taken with administrative details bureaucratic details and there was not enough time left over to be the the mentor and to teach and to teach mm. yeah. uh, and his views as an educator also included in this book is uh, a series of interviews and this particular interview was uh, for St. Andrew's Student Magazine where your father's asked what do you feel can be done to improve the percentage of the GCE examination passes in our school especially amongst the arts and he says the most useful thing is not to achieve more passes in GCE but to widen and set free our education so that it comes closer to meeting real human needs mm. um, did this come through when he was you know chief administrator as principal so mm. to speak Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he was always, um, you know, I mean, uh, St. Andrews to a, to, a, to a certain extent, large extent is still that today. It doesn't really focus so much on the academic achievements. And I'm glad that, he'd be very glad, I think, to see today that um, we are no longer uh, boasting about the top boy and top girl and so on. We've moved away from that. You know? um, he he was much more concerned about the, the laggards, the fate, the the kids who seem to be failures in school. Why was that? Did he have a and natural was, affinity with the underdog for yeah, a reason? Yeah, yeah, I think he did, definitely. He says so that he always felt um, an affinity for the underdog and um, and a belief that you should not label anybody as failures. Um, you know, he, he uh, many times in many speeches and, and articles, he talked about the danger of dubbing, of calling students, labeling students as failures. Uh, he felt if a student failed academically, it was not necessarily the student's fault, but the fault of the school and, and the educational system. Um, he warned about, um, the, the, he talk, spoke about the importance of valuing a child for what he is, not to reject him for what he is not. Um, he had a unique take on discipline as well, ahead of ah. his time perhaps, yeah? Well, yeah, as a principal he sometimes had to cane people I don't know whether corporal punishment still goes on uh, it, it might but in his time he had to do it and he took his, his responsibilities and duties as a principal seriously you know he put on the very stern face and face and, and when a boy is sent naughty boy is sent to his office and if he needed to cane or, or smack somebody on the hand with a ruler he would do it but there were times when he would apply reverse psychology he'd go through the motions of whatever he did to before caning a boy and close all the doors so that there's privacy and get out his ruler or cane, flex it to show that he meant it. Um, but there were many times, I think, when instead of caning, he would ask the boy to hold out his hand and the boy would expect to be hit on the hand. But instead of the ruler descending upon it, my father handed the ruler or cane to him and say, and then he held out his hand and he would say to the boy, now you hit me. And the boy might balk at doing this, but you know he would insist on doing it. And the lesson in this for the boy was probably greater than yet another caning. Yeah, outstanding. You know, so yeah. revolutionary. Um, 
Did did your father's views, did your father's political views change at all over time? If you're just tuned in, we are talking to Margaret Thomas about Francis Thomas, who was found a member of the Labour Party of Singapore in 1948. When he left, he said, you know, I'm more suited to making change happen on a smaller scale. Mm. And he seemed to close the door on politics. Mm. Did his political views change? I don't think his political views change, but he, he never wanted to be a politician. I mean, he got involved in politics by accident. And when he did um, uh, enter, pol- I mean, um, join the Labour Party and so on, and and continue with various um, uh, r- various roles, he he was trying to keep out of the hurly burly of politics, but got drawn in because he had no choice. He had felt he felt he had to live up to, I mean, take on the mantle of leadership because it was necessary. Um, but when he left um, politics and returned to teaching, I suppose there could have been options if he would wanted to stay on with with the PAP. Um, he was not interested. He never saw himself as a politician or a political ideologue in any way. Um, but he continued to have an interest, obviously, in politics. And I remember sitting with him or being with him um, it was either the 1972 or the 1976 general election. We were watching the results on TV, you know, when the results are announced one by one. And there was a clear sense of his disappointment as he was yet another landslide victory. Not that he wanted to see the PAP toppled, not not at all. But he would have liked to have seen a viable opposition emerge because he really believed that you get strength in diversity, that you do need a variety of views in order to make sure that what we arrive at is so it's the a right monolithic decision. nature of government yeah, that disappointed him. Exactly. I mean, you know, and I mean he felt for the underdog, he felt for the individual. He had a great belief in the um, strength of the individual, the the human spirit, the humanity that's in each of us. And to see this sort of blanket um, landslide landslide kind of political situation just filled him with a sense of despair, I think, which is what drove him to write that thing I read just now about the importance of citizens taking an interest in what's going on around them so that there are options not because he expected the PAP to fall or wanted to see it fall. Mm. You've got to have options. You've got to have a viable opposition if you're going to have a viable future. There is a new book that uh, people can expect that will be out next year. You, mm. you are basically completing your father's work, which he yeah. started in the last two years of his life. Give yeah. us some insight into that. Okay, when he, when he left, uh, sadly, when he left teaching in 1975, he retired as principal, continued teaching for about a year. And then he had to leave because he had a very bad pain in his hip and it turned out to be cancer, which was diagnosed much too late and there wasn't much that could be done about it. Mm. So in 1976-77, as he was battling cancer, um, he began, he needed to fill his time. One thing he did was take up wood carving, but the bulk of his time was really in coming out with a book he was going to call The Politics of Defeat which was, as he put it, the inside story and what was happening in Singapore politics in 58-59, which is the dying days of the Labour Front. Um, During that period, uh, he had quite a lot of meetings, some of them with Lee Kuan Yew, PAP, with various people. It was a time of political turmoil. There were many parties jostling for power. And at of these meet at these meetings, he would make he called it make notes. He had a sort of secret diary of what was going on, handwritten notes. Mm. Um, so, during this time, 76, 77, he basically transcribed his notes mm-hmm. and began to make comments about each entry. And then he began to shape his book. He managed to do two chapters which were introdu- introductory, setting the scene. And then his cancer got too bad and he couldn't finish it. So you're finishing it? Well, and I've been sitting on this for, what, nearly 40 years now. You know, my excuse was I was busy with journalism. I, I'm not a student of history. I don't have a deep personal interest in, in the details of that time. But I think I owe it to him to try and finish it. Not not to write it. I was a child. I have no way I can bring anything to it. But I can go through his notes and present it, just put it in a little bit of context, a bit of explaining, explaining with some help from people who have a... Well, we look forward to that and to hearing more Francis Thomas's words come through and still continue to teach. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Margaret Thomas, my guest in WOW. The book again is Memoirs of a Migrant. It's by Francis Thomas. Thanks for your company. Add to your WOW Factor with Michelle Martin in the WOW Club on 938 Live.